welcome to the 12th episode of Talk Wildlife. Today we're going to be talking about the first official red list for British mammals, which was recently highlighted by the Mammal Society. Before we start today, just a couple of things. So we often just give little updates or anecdotes about things that have been happening. And I just wanted to say that we said on the last podcast that we hadn't been about a lot and we hadn't been doing as many podcasts as usual. And we just wanted you to know that it's not because we're losing interest or anything like that. We just had a lot of other projects we were working on, namely two. One of them I still can't say a lot about, but the other one, I was actually doing work with Kevin and our friend Aidan, working on a video for the Early Career Naturalist Challenge for Hen Harrier Day. And the video we made actually came third, which is really exciting. So uh, Aidan, our good friend, is great at the camera, so he went out and he did filming for us, and we told him what we wanted, and then Kevin just kind of helped behind the scenes, just while well, he drove us there and he just kind of helped me keep everything up to date and would give me things I needed for each scene and I wrote the scripts which took a lot longer than I thought it would because it was hard to condense everything into four minutes and then presented it and edited it and the whole thing was done within about 24 hours the script taking a bit longer beforehand I was so happy with uh, how well it went and if you want to watch the video it's only about four minutes long you can find it on my Instagram which is at flowblackborn and I think I'll probably post it on the Talk Wildlife page as well, so that if you want to look at it, you can. Also, another thing I want to say, you may occasionally in this podcast hear a bit of background noise, like banging, kind of like a tap, tap, tap. And we try and usually get rid of this sound either afterwards in editing or at the time by moving our jackdaws into the other room. But, you know, they're not too bad, and we thought the odd bit of noise, so that they can have some nice time outside their cage, which is where they spend most of the day out with us rather than inside. We didn't think it'd be fair on them to put them back just for a podcast, especially when it's a nature wildlife podcast. It doesn't seem fair that they would suffer for us to talk about wildlife. So we'll do our best to get rid of the sound. They shouldn't be too bad. So, moving on. Let's talk wildlife. So this is quite a sad topic today. It was recently brought out by the Mammal Society that one in four British mammals is at risk of extinction. Kev, how terrifying is that? It's absolutely shocking. I mean, I keep reading over the list and the Mammal Society has published this on their social media and on their website. And you can look at lists for the UK as a whole, for Wales, England and Scotland. Each one of them paints a really dim picture of the state of our wildlife. If anyone didn't realise how bad a state our British mammals are in, these reports really highlight the horrors which are happening. And there's some mammals on here which you will be so shocked to hear are in need of our help now, urgently. Yeah, so according to the figures, 50% of the mammals in Scotland require urgent action as opposed to 45% in the UK as a whole. But one in four are at risk of extinction and I believe in Wales it's one in three? Yes, in Wales it's one in three species threatened with extinction. I mean these are shocking numbers and any animal lover, you know, or naturalist or anyone who cares about our country and our wildlife needs to take action to read these reports and try and find ways that we can change this because it's, it's really sad we're destroying our planet. It's worrying as well how many people do care about wildlife and yet this still happens because in a lot of ways our attitude to wildlife for many people is better than it used to be and I don't mean as an individual but I mean if you look back at all the culls that used to happen you know centuries ago and it's still not great but we're a lot better in some ways so you'd think that they might start to do a little bit better. Yeah, I mean unless we have dramatic change in our countries with you know and i'll say i i i think unless we have dramatic rewilding happening and giving large swathes of land back over to nature we're going to lose a lot of species in even in our lifetimes even to the listeners who listen to this podcast just grasp this that we're going to lose mammals and we are already losing insects and, and birds from our country in our lifetime that's not acceptable that should be acceptable. I think it's everyone's duty to act to try and stop this. Well, hopefully it won't happen in our lifetime because people will care and because people will work on it. I mean, wildcats, what's left of them? I don't think there'd be anything if people hadn't made such concerted efforts to keep them going. 
There is a last stand happening right now by the Royal Zoological Society um, of Scotland who have a specialised centre where they're doing, I believe, breeding programmes for Scottish wildcats. And without that, we'd probably lose them. So these are vital actions taken um, to try and preserve this species, try and stop them going extinct from Scotland. So the way we're going to do this I'm going to talk about Scotland and list the endangered and the vulnerable etc species and Kevin's going to come in and mention Wales and England because there wasn't one for Northern Ireland or Republic as far as I believe. No there wasn't. There, was, no. there were four main sort of sheets or graphics if you like and that was Scotland, Wales, England and then Britain as a whole. So I'll just start off. Okay, firstly, critically endangered, and that includes the wild cat, and this is Scotland, remember. Interbreeding with domestic cats, whether cats that live in someone's house or feral cats, means that there are very few true wild cats. There are up to 1.5 million feral cats in the UK, so this makes it really difficult to be sure that a wild cat isn't going to breed with a domestic cat. But these animals are persecuted by farmers and gamekeepers for the protection of birds, even though it is illegal and it went on a lot in the past. It's also quite common for it to happen, apparently, accidentally, because it's quite hard to tell the difference between a feral cat and a wild cat in some cases, at least from afar. The wild cat is regionally extinct in Wales and England, meaning there's none in the country at all. And just to go on, it um, does also appear across the board the mammals that's extinct in the UK is the wolf. Yeah. And it's yeah. on the top but of it's every not single just the one. Wolves. I wonder why the wolf has been put on. Because they're not the only ones. Yeah, because there's there's like wild boar, there's yeah. I guess there are wild boar in the UK already. There's lynx, there's elk, there's all these other massive Going mammals. Back, there's many, many, many. Scotland seems to be a stronghold for quite a lot of animals, not just mammals. I mean we've got pine martins, wild cats, red squirrels, black grouse. Beavers. Yeah. I think Scotland's strongholds are really the isles. There's um, yeah. populations around the isles where, you know, the Hen Harry survived, you know, almost complete persecution in Scotland by by living on Orkney until they spread uh, south. Um, and then you've got um, the, you know, the golden eagles and the white-tailed sea eagles. They've all done really well in the isles, but as soon as these animals come into the mainland and up to the uplands and the, and the moorlands, they don't do so well. Mm -hmm. We heard today that another hen harrier has mysteriously disappeared over a Scottish grouse moor. And this is just a few days after National Hen Harrier Day, um, which Flo had her movie shown uh, on. And it's just shocking. You know, a whole day of people coming together for hen harriers, and then a few days later we find another hen harrier's mysteriously missing. Mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's just so shocking. So another risk to wild cats is disease from domestic cats, but there is captive breeding being done. There's an organisation called Scottish Wild Cat Action, which is working really hard on this. So the other critically endangered mammal in Scotland is the harvest mouse. And this is in part due to severe weather, farming practices such as combine harvesting and pesticides. And I wasn't really expecting harvest mouse to be in there because they seem really iconic. You always see pictures of them in fields and things you know photographers get really nice pictures of them and I just never it never struck me that they were critically endangered I know but this okay this is different for England and Wales there's a different story coming out of these countries where the harvest mouse is vulnerable so it's not in immediate danger at the moment obviously there's an ongoing problem and this problem is worse in Scotland okay so now endangered Two species of mammals in Scotland which are endangered are the Eurasian beaver and the polecat. So first of all, the beaver. They're funnily enough less popular in Scotland than they are in England, which seems strange. Um, but they were hunted to extinction in the 16th century and then reintroduced, and they are struggling. I mean, I guess the numbers are so low anyway because there's only small pockets of them, and they are they are increasing in number, though... The Scottish government agreed for a quarter, I think it's a quarter of all Scottish beavers to be culled, which is, is crazy. And we mentioned this before, because in England, there's so many estates crying out for beavers, 
and they can legally translocate these beavers from Scotland where they're causing troubles to England where they're wanting them. You know, why kill an animal when other people are willing to take the animal and increase their population down there? Why even bother reintroducing them if you're going to persecute them like that? It doesn't make sense. And I think things like this need to be looked at. There needs to be some kind of accountability for, for these decisions. Because if you look in, in England, they're critically endangered, right? And I didn't know this, but there um, I know there's fence trials going on in England. And just last week, the English government said that the beavers in England can stay, which is fantastic news. Um, that's definitely going to help them at these fenced-in trial sections. But I didn't realise there are 11 different scattered wild populations in England. And there's, some of these 11 may just be one individual, but I didn't even know that was a thing. It does seem unfair how humans hunted them to extinction, chose to reintroduce them, and then chose to kill some of the very few that were introduced. Surely we have it one way or the other. We, we want beavers back, probably because we want to say, oh, we reintroduced the beavers and it's really nice having these animals and make us look good. But then we kill them. Well, I'll tell you what, think of it like this. And in Scotland, if they keep issuing licences the way they did, they'd wipe the beavers out within maybe five years or so. So we just reintroduce, reintroduce the population. We've just given them legal protection only to almost wipe them out again. If that did happen, I think we would have completely foregone any right we ever have to reintroduce them again. And yeah. it makes me think a bit about the mountain hares, how they just got protection but they're still being culled now. And I understand it's because there wasn't a lot of time between protection being granted and the culls. But it just, I don't know, it's not, it's not really But they cull them for sport. They cull them for, to make money. So they could have easily just stopped that and not allow it to be a thing until the reviews were done. But hey, it just seems like, I mean, look at this, right? So you've got the beavers, they've got legal protection, nearly a quarter of them were killed by license legally. You've got the hares, got government protection, and there's still an open season going on right now. So the polecat, there are fewer than a thousand expected to be left. And they interbreed with wild ferrets, kind of like the wildcat does with domestic cats. They also have a diet of rats, amongst other things, which can be poisoned and then lead to them dying. And they're also persecuted by gamekeepers and are at risk of car strikes. I mean, there's all sorts of risks towards them, but that's just a few. So I didn't have any data for uh, polecats in England or Wales, but I did have um, kind of like an equivalent. Pine martens are doing really good in Scotland. Uh, they're critically endangered in England and in Wales, but Wales have done, um, in 2015, a reinforcement action where they brought in pie martins from Scotland to help bolster the populations in Wales because they were such a low number and they're fragmented. And I believe that they're starting to spread throughout Wales and over the border into England, which is fantastic news. So I know... This podcast may sound like bad news after bad news, but amongst these stories, there are areas where there is really good news coming out of it. So go on the uh, Scottish pine martins going down there into Wales and helping our Welsh pine martins recover because, you know, these kind of actions and these conservation projects really do work and it's really good to see them working because they need it more now more than ever. So onto the vulnerable ones. There are four species of mammal listed under vulnerable. First of all, the Orkney vole, which is at risk due to habitat loss and stoats predating on them, which were introduced in 2010. And then there's the very famous, much loved hedgehog. So they're at risk of all sorts of things, road traffic collisions, um, being walled in or fenced in different gardens so they can't travel around, Strimmers, habitat loss, uh, chemicals which they eat from their prey, for example, like slug pellets, bad weather, climate change, ponds, bonfires, buckets of water, holes in the ground, netting, dogs, all sorts of uh, human related risks towards them. And it's funny because hedgehogs are generally known to be quite popular and quite loved, but I've seen so much, not necessarily hatred towards hedgehogs, but just indifference. I've worked at two Alderfrisk centres now, and both of them I've seen people bring hedgehogs in just because they don't want them in their garden. 
which is just not just ridiculous but also what gives you the right to take an animal you might see that garden as your garden but it, the hedgehog doesn't see it as your garden it sees it as its turf so it's just you shouldn't have the right to do that sort of thing although saying that I'd rather you bring it in than try and kill it or do something that ends up killing it well remember that that woman um, up in Aberdeenshire she mm. had a hedgehog in her garden she was trying to sell a house and she said what am I meant to do about it it's not my hedgehog I don't want it I don't know what to do with it. I'm trying to sell my house. I can't sell it with a hedgehog in the garden. And we were like, but a hedgehog will make people more likely to buy your garden. No, you've got amazing wildlife in it. And, you know, she said, if you don't come get rid of it, I'll get rid of it in my own way. She was implying that she was going to kill the hedgehog. And we had three baby hedgehogs come in the other day. The youngest of one, only 38 grams, complete baby. And someone found the nest and just decided to box them up and make someone bring them in. Um, it's just it's just ridiculous and it, it's a real risk to the young it's not like a wildlife rescue centre is as good for them as their mother for so many reasons and they just found the nest in their garden and decided not to leave it alone I mean you don't know whether there's any babies left you don't know you know what the situation with those young were they if you find a hedgehog nest just leave it get advice before you do any actions that that person should have called someone for advice first before just lifting up a hedgehog nest well, from what I heard, it wasn't even in the best interest. They were doing it because they were like, oh, I don't want this there. It's just ridiculous. I didn't meet the person, so I can't say for sure. Glad I didn't meet the person. Um, or know the circumstance. In England and Wales, the hedgehog is the same status as they're in Scotland. And they're having the exact same problems. There are many more problems that I didn't even list. So another vulnerable species is the otter. And they're persecuted through shooting and trapping. Uh, they've been hunted in the past very, very badly. They're affected by road traffic collisions and pollution, amongst many other things. So I managed to find some uh, data with otters in England. They're least concerned, so they're not thought to be in any danger. However, still vulnerable in Wales. So the last one on the vulnerable list is an Athusius pipistrel bat. So there's a few different types of pipistrel, and this is one of them. They're affected by all sorts of things but largely wind turbines and artificial lighting as they are migratory species. There's loads of the other things as well, you know, car strikes, fly paper, cats, chemical treatments, and then there's general roost disturbances by humans, chemical treatments in roofs, climate change, building and development. That's sad, but it's very, very true. I'm actually going to highlight three different bat species which um, are either endangered or critically endangered. In Wales, the Betstain's bat is endangered, while in England, the Great Tamalseid bat is critically endangered. So it's right up there. So they need help uh, now. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there is projects in place to try and help these bats. And the last one I found was the Grey Long-Eared bat in England, which is endangered. There's around only a thousand left. Um, and they need meadows to feed. But sadly, since World War II, meadows have declined. They're, they're, that type of meadow they need to feed on is declined by 97%. So, you know, those fowls on left must be around these small pockets of these meadows. Let's hope there's, there's places out there where these bats are thriving that people are just not aware of. Why don't we, sometime in the next few weeks, do an episode where we list the exact same species again, but instead of saying what has a negative impact on them, why don't we list what people can do to help them? Since they're critically endangered, some of them, people won't live near them, so their actions might not help them, but we'll try and find different things that can be done. However, you don't need to be in Scotland to help the Scottish Wildcats, because you can support them through fundraising and donating, and I'm sure if you go on the websites, for these organisations that are coming together to try and protect the Scottish Wildcats. There's many different ways, everyday people who don't live anywhere near. So if you're in Essex or Surrey or Dorset or Wales and you want to help the Scottish Wildcat, we'll see if we can find a way that you can help remotely. Yeah. Okay, so we've finished the vulnerable list. Now on to the near threatened, which is the last of the four different levels. So this one really surprised me. I thought they were doing well. This is the red fox. In the last 17 years, there's been a 26% decline. That's just astounding, in my opinion. I consider them to be common, so if they're struggling, then anything can be struggling. 
They're affected by falling rabbit populations, habitat loss, car collisions, poisonings, shootings, and I would say hunting, but I don't think hunting has a huge impact on the population as a whole, especially when you consider hunts have been revealed to actually be breeding foxes or encouraging foxes. Yeah, that's true. I'm just going to say from the data that I gather from my business about foxes, I know there are certain areas in Scotland where there is a mass abundance of foxes. There is no shortage yes. at all. Near us, I mean, just outside ours, we saw a fox not so long ago. I uh, come back from working at the wildlife rescue, we saw a fox at the end of our road. There are foxes about, you just need to know where to look to find them. So I'd, I'd be interested in how they, they managed to get the data together for this. If you went to search for foxes in the hotspots that I know about through my business, you'll be going foxes are least concerned because there's so many. You could say that about a lot of species. I mean, if you went to one of the places where the bat that we talked about earlier is common, one of the meadows, you could see maybe 10 of them one evening and say, oh, well, they're not doing so badly. It's just yeah, that's the true. Right place. I guess you could go to the Isle of Mole looking for Orkney voles and find none and go to <laughs> yeah. Orkney to look for Orkney voles and find tons and go, well, or they're doing well. Or for badgers. <laughs> yes, where there is none. <laughs> and yet there's still TB. Hmm, strange. That is. Almost as if badgers aren't the reason. So next on the near threatened list is red squirrels, which are affected by, again, many things, including habitat loss, road traffic collisions, climate change. And I won't sit here and blame grey squirrels at all, because even if they do have an impact, which I'm sure they do to some level, that still comes back to it being our fault. So we may as well just say humans. They are attacked by domestic animals as well. But yeah, grey squirrels... The effect they do have is human's fault, so that just comes under human error. Well, actually, when, when you look at the the red squirrels, um, I saw a study um, online going through what the biggest killer of red squirrels are, and surprisingly, grey squirrels and the pox was actually near the bottom of the list. The top... How long was the list? I think there's about five or six different factors. Uh, the top one was... Humans and our vehicles. Most of the red squirrels which die are run over by humans' vehicles. I reckon, say it was five, and say grey squirrels were the fifth. I'm assuming every other one was human. Habitat loss is human related. Um, being attacked by dogs and that is human related. There's only one which probably wouldn't be human related, which I think would be quite high up still, would be natural predation. So, three more new threatened species. Oh, sorry, I just, the last one I have is for red squirrels. In England and Wales, they're endangered, um, and it's mainly down to past persecutions and the removal of the habitat. I think that's the biggest problem for red squirrels in England and Wales, simply not the habitat they used to be for them, because humans took it all away. Yeah, so here's something to mention. One of the reasons red squirrels are doing so badly is because they were hunted a lot in the 19th and 20th century, early 20th, um, throughout the 19th. And they were largely hunted because they were blamed for a lot of the things that greys are now blamed for. For example, stripping tree bark. And one hunting season, I believe 10,000 red squirrels were killed. Was that just by one hunting club, I believe? The Highland, the Highland Hunting yeah, Club, yeah. Yeah, in the yeah. Highlands. So again, humans have played a huge effect. More than I think most people believe. And we keep talking about doing a podcast episode about it. But I, I'm putting it off along with a lot of other podcast ideas that I want to do, simply because I believe that we do the podcast and then a few weeks, days, months, whatever later, I find a fantastic study and I think, oh, I wish I'd put that in. And then I'd feel like I hadn't done justice with that podcast episode because I hadn't mentioned it. So I'm almost putting it off because I don't want to risk missing something out. I suppose we can do more than one episode um, for a topic or we can mention it later on. Anyway, so three more species to go, near threatened. The next one is the water vole, which is affected by habitat loss and fragmentation, pollution, riverside management, and more. Well, there's um, not far from where we are, in the city centre of Glasgow, there is a strong water vole population. In fact, we had water voles come into the wildlife rescue that you work at. And they were there until they were taken back to suitable habitats to be put back in the wild again. There's quite a few, I believe. But in Glasgow, I mean, you can Google it, Glasgow's water voles. And I think these water voles have also been found to not be living on water as well. So the water voles living in grass environments, which is incredible. Um, but I think there's a lot of work being done into them. And they've got a lot of protection from the people of Glasgow. Uh, the people of Glasgow are really good when they rally around 
um, certain projects and they love their water bowls. So go Glasgow. Second to last, the mountain hare, which is persecuted for protection of grouse and is affected by, again, habitat loss and fragmentation. I talk about it a very, very tiny amount in my Optins video. And I think we've mentioned it in another episode of ours. I think it was the um, Perceived Pests Part 2 again. It was, yeah. yeah. I think I did a beaver and the hare, actually, so I yeah, think you're right. Yeah, that sounds about right. And, yeah, they're, they're killed to protect red grouse. Because they potentially could transfer ticks which might harm the, the grouse. So the last one is the Leisler's bat, which is affected by loss of woodland and mature trees. This does sound bad, but if you think it sounds bad and it makes some emotion come to you that you, you're angry or upset, use that emotion and get active, get out there, get in touch with whichever conservation organisation is doing their bit to try and help these species. And if this episode has brought strong emotion about for you, be it anger or sadness, um, use that emotion to drive you to do something to help these species because if we don't act as people as communities as countries as one we're going to lose some of these species and then i will be angry because if we lose them in a lifetime i'll be angry at myself because i'm going to ask myself what have i done you know i've been sitting making podcast episodes when an animal has potentially gone extinct in scotland and it won't be our only failing either because we've already allowed so many species to go extinct. Oh, I'm reading books at the moment which are just horrific how many species our, our country, the UK as a whole, have lost. Um, and I think we all should educate ourselves on what was once in here and why they're not in this country anymore. There's a lot of species and it's hard reading, really hard reading, but I think we all need to know what was here and what's gone. So we, we can appreciate what we have left, what little yeah, we have left. Exactly. So on that note, we'll end the podcast and we will try and do an episode at some point coming up, listing those species again and this time including things you can do to help. Of course, as I said before, not every single species it'll be easy to help directly, but we can mention a few charities that can be helped as well. If you want to do your bit right now, you can share this podcast with your friends and family your work colleagues even, or if you're part of a wildlife group or conservation group, share this so other people are aware about what's going on. Um, like us on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, subscribe to that channel. Yeah, we have Twitter now. Uh, we haven't used it very much, but the um, handle, we couldn't fit Talk Wildlife Podcast, so it's Talk Wildlife Pod, all one word. But do follow us on there and we are going to start using it a lot more, especially as we get more followers. Yeah, and that's something you can do right now, even while you listen to this, this episode. The others are all at Talk Wildlife Podcast, I believe. Instagram, Facebook, and then you can find us on Podbean, Spotify. Oh, YouTube as well. YouTube is good because it also has the annotations if it's easier for you to read what we're saying. And it's just easier to find too if you don't have a subscription to you know, Podbean or Spotify. Thank <laughs> you.